On this Friday night, the cascading effects of the U.S. president testing positive for COVID-19. The consequences for the campaign. What happens if he becomes incapacitated? And will this serve as a wake-up call? He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Plus, the potential super spreader event. Parts of Ontario clamped down the new restrictions and the plan to clear the testing backlog. And gut-wrenching grief. <laughs> Joyce Eshaquan's family escalate their fight for justice. Global National with Donna Friesen. There have been plenty of historic events at the home of the U.S. president, but nothing like this. Inside the White House, President Donald Trump and his wife Melania spent the day in self-isolation, both of them infected with the virus that has killed more than one million people around the world. Good evening and thanks for joining us just 32 days before the presidential election and there is anxiety and uncertainty. Late today, the president was seen for the first time since his diagnosis, giving a thumbs up and boarding Marine One, which took him to Walter Reed Medical Center in Maryland. The White House says it's out of an abundance of caution. Before he left, Trump recorded a short message. I think I'm doing very well. But we're going to make sure that things work out. The First Lady is doing very well. The White House says his symptoms are mild, but he does have a fever. He is 74, overweight, and that puts him at higher risk. He announced his positive test in a tweet, hours after the news broke, that one of his trusted advisors and longtime senior aides, Hope Hicks, developed symptoms and tested positive on Thursday morning. Both she and Trump were in close contact with many people this week, rarely wearing a mask, and it's having a cascading effect not just on his campaign, but on senior levels of government. The vice president, Mike Pence, and his wife said they tested negative today. So has House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and a whole lot of other senior people, including the attorney general and the secretary of state. The chair of the Republican National Committee is positive, though, and many others are still waiting for test results. Trump was on stage with his rival Joe Biden on Tuesday at the debate, though they stayed apart and did not shake hands. Biden said today he's taken two tests and he is negative, so is his wife. He continued his campaign today, sending his best wishes to the president and first lady and making a plea for everyone to wear a mask in public. We can save more than 100,000 American lives in the next 100 days alone if everyone wore a mask in public. Jackson Prosco joins me from Washington. Jackson, Trump going from home to the hospital the day after he's diagnosed suggests his symptoms are more than just mild. What can you tell us? It's not just that, Donna. It's the fact that the president, according to White House doctors, was given an experimental antibody therapy today, a high dose of that experimental therapy uh, based on compassionate grounds, which means it was essentially released to somebody who would not typically have access to a non-approved medication. All of this suggests things may be more serious than the White House is letting on. There's a tremendous amount of concern tonight, but the fact that the president walked to that helicopter to be airlifted to a Walter Reed Medical Center does suggest, at least for now, He's doing okay. President Donald Trump may have already been feeling unwell as he returned from a private fundraiser Thursday night. Hours later, he revealed his positive diagnosis in a tweet. Tonight, the First Lady and I tested positive for COVID-19, he wrote. We will begin our quarantine and recovery process immediately. We will get through this together. They remain in good spirits. Uh, uh, the president does have mild symptoms. And, Trump's and, chief of staff appeared without a mask to warn of more cases likely to come. I fully expect uh, that as this virus continues to go on, other people in the White House will certainly uh, 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 have a, a, a positive test result. Soon after, the president missed a planned phone call with governors about the COVID-19 response. <laughs> Trump and the first family suspended all future in-person campaigning. Vice President Mike Pence, who would have to assume the duties of the president should Trump's condition worsen, will still travel to events. Often those who go on to develop severe disease, the critical period is around 10, 12 days um, since symptom onset. Um, and and so, so that's the period, uh, you know, we are all, all hoping uh, will pass uh, uneventfully. The White House says it learned Trump's aide Hope Hicks was positive just as the president departed for a private fundraiser Thursday night. 
but they let Trump continue on to the event where he may have unknowingly exposed high-paying donors. It was deemed safe for the president to go. Um, he socially distanced. It was an outdoor event, and it was deemed safe uh, by uh, White House operations for him to attend that event. You... Given the window for infection, Trump may have been contagious during Tuesday's presidential debate. Masks make a big difference. Where Trump's family defied mask requirements and sat barefaced in the crowd as the president mocked his rival Joe Biden over the issue of face masks. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking... 200 feet away from it, he shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Biden has since tested negative. But just like Trump, a cluster of people who were at a White House event last Saturday for the new Supreme Court nominee have now tested positive, including the president of the University of Notre Dame and Utah Republican Senator Mike Lee, seen here hugging other maskless attendees in the Rose Garden. Jackson, Trump's justification for rarely wearing a mask was that most people who come into close contact with him are tested first, and we know they use rapid tests at the White House. What are experts saying about that strategy tonight? You know, the medical experts I spoke with today say it's great that somebody like Trump, who comes into contact with a lot of people, is tested frequently, but that's just one part of the strategy. They say he still needs to adopt things like mask wearing and social distancing and proper ventilation in the rooms that he's in. Really, they say that uh, the testing that he's been undergoing may have actually created a false sense of security here. And anecdotally, you certainly hear that from people who work in and around the White House, that mask wearing just has not been commonplace inside that bubble, that there's been a lot of confidence that testing alone would keep the virus at bay. Okay, Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. Well, there is a protocol in place if the U.S. president becomes incapacitated and can't carry out his duties. The U.S. Constitution in the 25th Amendment makes clear the vice president assumes the powers and duties if the president is unable to do so because of death, resignation, or inability. Section 3 allows the president to transfer power voluntarily to the vice president, even for a few hours, if that's necessary. And Section 4 addresses a more complex issue when a president is incapable or unwilling to declare his incapacity. Then the vice president and a majority of cabinet would declare the president unable to carry out his duties and power would immediately transfer to the vice president. And if both the president and the vice president are incapacitated, then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is next in line. The White House did say today the president remains fully in charge. Anyone who came into close contact with him in the past few days is at risk. And that is a lot of people. As Jeff Semple explains, contact tracers have their work cut out for them. Tracing the contacts of anyone with COVID-19 is a challenge, but perhaps no one more so than the president of the United States during a campaign. The network of people that, that he's with and, and uh, their networks um, is enormous. Donald Trump had a busy week, but reports say he didn't start feeling sick until late Thursday. The average incubation period is about five days. So you're exposed to someone and then five days later they can have symptoms. That means Trump may have become infected last weekend. On Saturday, he announced his Supreme Court pick in the Rose Garden in front of a crowd of 200 people at least two of whom, including Senator Mike Lee, have also since tested positive for COVID-19. On Sunday, Trump held a socially distanced press conference and that evening hosted an indoor reception for military families. This White House video shows most, including the president, not wearing a mask. Nor did Trump wear a mask or socially distance on Monday when he hosted some American automakers to celebrate their latest truck. Trump has previously said that all guests are tested before they get near him. But experts warn those rapid tests aren't always reliable. And that's why, you know, all things being equal, if there's any doubt in your mind, uh, really just wear the mask. By Tuesday's presidential debate, experts say it's possible Trump was already contagious. 24 to 48 hours before you develop symptoms, you can still infect others, uh, which is what makes this virus so difficult to control. He and his presidential opponent spent over an hour shouting over each other, albeit at a distance, and Joe Biden has since tested negative. But the next day, Trump traveled to Minnesota for a rally attended by thousands, most maskless and he attended a closed-door fundraiser at a private home. He traveled there with his aide, Hope Hicks. She started feeling sick that night and tested positive the next day. Trump traveled to New Jersey Thursday afternoon for another fundraiser. This could lead to a significant outbreak. New Jersey's governor has asked anyone who attended the events to self-quarantine. 
Contact tracers say their one advantage in this case, anyone who might have had contact with a contagious Donald Trump has surely heard about it by now. President Trump as a super spreader is um, uh, an unexpected story with uh, 32 days to go. Jeff Semple, Global News. If there is one person who knows what President Trump is going through, it is British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. The 56-year-old had COVID-19 in March. His symptoms were so severe at one point, he ended up in intensive care for three days, fighting for his life. He did recover, and he named his baby son after two doctors who cared for him. He later admitted he hadn't taken the virus seriously enough. Today, Johnson wished President Trump and the First Lady a speedy recovery. I think we all want to send our best wishes to the President and uh, the First Lady, and uh, I've done that this morning, as you can imagine. And uh, I'm sure that they'll both stage a very strong recovery. Well wishes, too, from Russian President Vladimir Putin, who has been following a strict work-from-home regime, mostly meeting people through video conferences instead of in person. Today, Putin sent Trump a telegram saying, I am sure that your inherent vitality, good spirits and optimism will help you cope with the dangerous virus. Political leaders here in Canada have tested positive too. And back in March, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau spent two weeks in quarantine after his wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, was diagnosed with the virus. Today, the Trudeau sent well wishes to the Trumps. Sophie and I both wish President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump a safe and speedy recovery. They had certainly reached out when Sophie got her diagnosis uh, earlier in the spring. And in Canada, the case numbers in parts of this country are still worrying. In Quebec, more than 1,000 positive tests were reported in the past 24 hours. That is the largest single-day increase since May 3rd. Ontario is reporting a record high number of new cases, 732 today. Nova Scotia is now reporting one new case of COVID-19. It's connected to travel outside the Atlantic bubble. Alberta has 122 new cases and BC 161. Quebec's premier is warning more restrictions may be coming. A partial lockdown is already in place in three regions, including Montreal and Quebec City. And Ontario is introducing a number of stricter public health measures, including a province-wide mask policy. The premier of Ontario telling people to keep their circles tight. Abigail Beeman reports. Our health system is in crisis because of the COVID-19 pandemic. A stark message from Ottawa Public Health. This system is nearly broken. The test swabs are waiting for analysis. They're sitting backlogged for over a week. And Dr. Vera Etches' national counterpart is no more cheerful. Dr. Teresa Tam says they've been keeping an eye on an increase in hospitalizations and deaths, now at 10 a day. She calls the curve's momentum the opposite of a roller coaster. The way up is fast and easy, but the way down is long and slow. And downward momentum can be stopped or even reversed with any wrong step. We also need to Figuring out where to put their feet, COVID-19 slammed provinces Ontario and Quebec. We need to reduce our social contacts. It's a question of life or death. In Quebec, red-zoned areas are already under lockdown, but with more than a thousand new cases Friday. We might need to close other activities in the coming days. We simplify it and, and we work on these hot, hot spots. While in Ontario, the Premier announced new restrictions for Ottawa, Toronto and Peel region. There are new patron caps for restaurants, banquet halls and gyms. For the whole province, more mask rules. And starting Sunday, you won't see long lines like these. No more walk-ins at testing centres. After two days to catch up on test processing and reset, they'll reopen Tuesday by appointment only. What we're saying is keep the social circles tight. Don't go out and have the extended families of 20, 25 people. Meanwhile, Toronto's medical officer of health wrote to the province asking for much tougher restrictions for her city. A ban on indoor dining, indoor sports and group exercise classes, and a ban on non-essential trips outside the house. Ford's announcement didn't go that far yet. An example of the push and pull around pandemic restrictions. Donna? Okay, Abigail Beeman in Ottawa, thank you. Anger and anguish. Coming up, Joyce Eshaquan's husband on what his wife endured and what he thinks of the hospital where she died.
The family of Joyce Echequan say they intend to take legal action. As she lay in a Quebec hospital, Echequan recorded a video pleading for help, and on it you can hear hospital staff insulting and demeaning her. Today, her husband said systemic racism has contaminated that hospital and killed his wife. Felicia Perillo reports in a warning some viewers may find the video disturbing. <laughs> In tears, hardly able to find his words, Joyce Eshaquan's husband says, they killed my wife. Four days after the 37-year-old died in a Quebec hospital, her family has announced they will be taking legal action. In the following weeks, a lawsuit against the Joliet Hospital and their employees will be filed. Also, we are of the, the opinion that criminal actions were made by the hospital. The mother of seven from the Atikamek community died on Monday at a Joliet hospital in disturbing circumstances. In her final moments, Eshaquan managed to record the insulting remarks hurled at her by hospital staff. She had been admitted for stomach pains a few days earlier. Both a nurse and an orderly have been fired and three investigations are underway. The family's lawyer says they'll file complaints with police, the Human Rights Commission and with the Quebec Order of Nurses. Echequan's death has sparked outrage across the province and calls for the government to act against systemic racism. Quebec Premier François Legault has called Echequan's death unacceptable and says he's committed to making changes, but he has repeatedly denied the existence of systemic racism. For me, it's in relation with the uh, uh, black people in the United States, uh, for a reason we know. For me, I don't see that in Quebec. But for sure, there is some racism against the First Nation in Quebec, and I want to fight. Atikamek community leaders are demanding an in-person meeting with the Premier. They also stress the need for him to admit that systemic racism exists and says if he doesn't, He's part of the problem. Felicia Perillo, Global News, Joliet, Quebec. B&B conspiracy ahead. An innkeeper on trial claims he's been helping U.S. Border Patrol. An American man accused of smuggling people into Canada now claims he's an informant for U.S. immigration officials. Canadian authorities charged Robert Boulay with human smuggling last year, and revelations from a separate U.S. court case appear to show American officials knew what he was up to for years. Paul Johnson explains. You couldn't have written a better screenplay about the Smugglers in saga. A man with a bed and breakfast right on the border and for years, complaints about a constant stream of people crossing his property from the U.S. and into Canada. Where are you from? I can't speak. Last spring, Canadian officials arrested smugglers in owner Robert Boulay and charged him with human smuggling. While that case is winding its way through the courts, many wondered how his alleged business was able to run for so long in a place so heavily watched particularly by the Americans. Now documents that have surfaced in an unrelated court case in Seattle raise intriguing questions about that. In a pile of heavily blacked out U.S. government papers, Boulay is reported as saying he has been assisting the Border Patrol since about 2003, providing their intelligence unit with information about his guests, which has resulted in numerous arrests. All of this under an arrangement Boulay said he had with the American border authorities. The U.S. Border Patrol says Boulay was not their informant, but their sister agency, ICE, declined to comment and said they don't talk about informants. There are a lot of questions here. Vancouver immigration lawyer Richard Curlin says if Boulay's arrangement was real, the implications are explosive. This is aiding and embedding a conspiracy to violate Canada's immigration system by an American intelligence asset. As for Boulay, his American lawyer told Global News that neither he nor Boulay can speak publicly about the case because of a court order obtained by the very agencies he claims to have collaborated with. Paul Johnson, Global News, Vancouver. Next, are there any takeaways from President Trump's diagnosis?
2020 just keeps delivering. Now even the American president has COVID-19. A 74-year-old man who started the year claiming the virus was just like the flu, who has repeatedly said it's under control and who has never been a strong advocate of wearing masks. The commander-in-chief of the U.S. now has a potentially life-threatening virus. It should be a wake-up call. Plenty of Americans know the risks of COVID-19. More than 200,000 have died from it and have listened to their president say things like this. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle. It will disappear. The faster we go back, the better it's going to be. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection? Now Trump has become infected himself. The president, whose Secret Service details surrounds him with concentric rings of security, could not be shielded from this invisible enemy. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson wasn't protected either. He's 18 years younger than Trump and got so sick with COVID he ended up in intensive care and admits he was close to death. The NHS has saved my life, no question. Things could have gone either way. It exposes a basic truth about COVID-19. No one is immune, there is no cure, and there is much we still don't know about the virus. The wise take it seriously and observe public health restrictions. Getting it is, for many, a scary and humbling experience. Will it change President Trump? Will he survive? And if he does, will he admonish those who dismiss it and refuse to wear masks? The world is left to wait and see how a silent enemy that has altered all of our lives will affect the future of America. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.